Kamala and Obama lecture America at the DNC. Antifa protesters trash New York City. Steve Bannon arrested on possible fraud charges. And what COVID testing is really like these days. Welcome, my friends, to the Buck Sexton Show. Oh, I'm so happy that we're pretty much through this DNC week. That's right. We've had to sit through it. I've had to watch it so that you don't have to. And there are some there are some key questions that you're left with after all of this. You have to ask, what exactly do Democrats stand for? We know they hate President Trump. That they've made very clear that Trump is the worst. Trump is a racist. He's destroying the country. He's undermining the Constitution. But you know the part of this that I always find so interesting and so instructive is that they say all these things, but then when it comes time to explain why they believe these things, they're very, very short on substance, very short on facts. They will say, for example, the president is a racist. You're Kamala, who as I'm watching this speech, it's just a reminder of why even Democrats didn't want to vote for her in the primary. She's somebody who can get appointed to uh, the presidency in a sense, assuming Joe Biden does step aside, as I think he will, but not somebody that anyone is excited to vote for, who's not a multimillionaire living in Malibu or the Upper West Side or Kalorama in D.C., right? I mean, th- that's where Kamala's base is. Kamala's base are the top hat wearing, monocle clad martini drinkers of the Democrat Party. They think she's great. And Biden is just the guy that has been there the whole time. Biden is the the guy standing in the back of the room when there's nobody else. You go, well, he's been here all along, so maybe we should give him a shot. But she says stuff. Kamala says stuff. And I'm glad people now say her name correctly. Even Biden will see how long that lasts. Uh, there's Kamala. Kamala. Sure. We'll hope Biden gets it right. But uh, Ms. Harris of course, hammered the point about Trump's racism. Play 16. And let's be clear. There is no vaccine for racism. We have got to do the work for George Floyd, for Breonna Taylor, for the lives of too many others to name, for our children and for all of us. We've got to do the work to fulfill that promise of equal justice under law. Because here's the thing, none of us are free until all of us are free. So we're at an inflection point. The constant chaos leaves us adrift. The incompetence makes us feel afraid. The callousness makes us feel alone. It's a lot. And here's the thing, we can do better uh, we can definitely do better than Biden Harris. That's for sure. This was this was instructive, though, from her speech. This this was meaningful because you can tell the Democrat opposition to Trump is, in fact, largely rooted in emotions, in feelings. Right. And, and this makes perfect sense, because one of the great separations between Republicans and Democrats as a general rule is that we try to think about what is and use logic and reason and be rational about decisions that government takes, actions that government engages in. That's what I'm always thinking about with government. It's not about how it makes me feel. It's not, oh, I'm a good person because I do this thing or that thing. Uh, But everything that they say about why to vote for the Democrats right now is uh, is rooted in an emotional appeal. And the opposition to President Trump is also rooted in an emotional appeal. They are the only policy shortcoming uh, that they will point to is Donald Trump's response to the COVID-19 virus. But even with that, it's it's rhetorical. It's Trump said it will go away. I don't like this thing that Trump said about it. What has he really done? He shut down flights from China. He got the ventilators in the early days of the pandemic when everybody was terrified we were going to run out of ventilators. He sent additional funding and resources. He sent hospital ships. What else was the president supposed to do? What, what was the action? What, a, nas- a national mask mandate? 
I, I will tell you this right now. Uh, we will find out in time that a national mask mandate would have done nothing. And it's not constitutional. Where is the federal government? What are they going to say? You getting sick involves interstate commerce. So under the interstate commerce clause, we're going to tell you that you have to wear a mask even if you're not sick to prevent other people from getting sick. If, if that's the position they take, then they can do this during the flu season. They can do it whenever they want. And what are the limits of government power at that point? They can lock you in your home and shut down your business and take away your freedom of movement, your freedom of speech, take away your freedom, period. They can do all of those things for a virus that kills 0.03% of people who get it, maybe. Yeah, that's the real number. Right? They've been saying all along, oh, originally it was going to be 5%. A small fraction of, and, and remember, it's about known cases that they're always gauging. And there are far more actual cases than we've ever know about. Um, I'll, I'll tell you more about my experience with COVID testing this week later on today. But I, I just want to note that the opposition to Donald Trump is a feeling opposition. It's, I don't like the way having a President Trump makes me feel. And if you vote for Democrat, you'll feel better. What's going to happen? What are the Democrats going to do with the power that they have that will keep you and your family safe? The first obligation of the state. Oh, they're going to defund police. That's going to make you feel safer. That's going to make your community better. I don't think so. What are they going to do that's, that makes you more prosperous, that makes you better off financially, socioeconomically? They're going to take money from you and give it to other people? Or they're going to give you some of what they take from other people. That's the promise that they make. That's never going to make you truly uh, prosperous. That's never going to be enough to make all that much of a difference. Is the false promise of Marxism. Make some people a little poor and other people a little less poor and everybody's going to be happy. It doesn't work that way. You still have individual choice with the resources you have. You still have people that make decisions that are long-term focus versus short-term focus. There will always be those who are struggling more financially. We already have a massive safety net in this country. And Democrats say they're going to expand it, but at, at what cost? We're heading to $27 trillion. If I had told you five years ago that the United States was heading toward $30 trillion of debt, you would have said, wow, we're, we're really flirting with true economic disaster. And I'm here to say we are. But what do the Democrats promise? A country where... The differences that we have in race become enshrined by legal mechanisms now. We're going to treat people differently based on, we already have been doing this for a while, but even more of that. Treat people differently based upon skin color. As if discriminating on the basis of race will somehow uh, make right previous discrimination on the basis of race. See, this is, a, this is a fallacy. This is illogical, but this is where the Democrats are because it makes them feel good right now. Barack Obama last night gave his speech standing in front of you know, the Constitution. And, and look, I, I will say Obama's skills as a politician are head and shoulders above Kamala and Biden and, and everybody knows it, and Hillary. And we'll get to her in a little bit, too. But for Barack Obama to pretend that he's a defender of and a deep believer in the Constitution is a form of gaslighting in and of itself. It's a slap in the face. Obama refused to abide by the limitations of the Constitution. He had a pen and a phone because he thought he knew better. He thought that he had a, a mandate from within to break constitutional bounds and, and uh, normative behavior for the executive branch, right? to write laws under the guise of executive action. And courts had to, many times over, slap down Obama's actions from the White House and the only reason he wasn't able to get those things through the Congress was that his agenda was so far left that the Democrats at that time in Congress weren't willing to go the full distance on climate change, weren't willing yet to go the full distance on amnesty. They did go as far as they could on health care. They wanted single payer, as we said all along. Single payer is just Medicare for all. But they created this stepping stone to it. We said that Obamacare was a stepping stone. I said that this was a stepping stone. And of course, we were right. But at the time, oh, that's terrible. 
It's kind of racist to say that Obama is creating a socialist health care system. Don't be so racist. No, it's just the truth. It's the truth. But here you have a Democrat Party that I think is on very weak ground, uh, ground making its case against President Trump. For as long as they hold up governors like Cuomo, who had the most disastrous leadership of the entire COVID pandemic, as long as they hold them up and pretend that they're examples for others to follow, no person who is objective and fair-minded can see the Democrat criticisms of Trump during the pandemic and say it's anything other than just the most basic politics. That's what they're doing. This is what the whole, the whole DNC is a rehash of previous criticisms of Trump without being able to look at specific policies. It's all very subjective. Oh, Trump has undermined our norms and pulled us apart. And Trump has pulled us apart. The Democrats are, are stuck in a, in a mass psychosis where their party wants to get rid of cops, wants to undermine our basic physical safety as a society. And they're pretending that the Republicans and Trump are the ones that are causing division. They're, they're pretending that Trump is the reason that we don't, we don't all come together and have, a, have agreements on, on core policy issues for this country going forward. This is absurd. This is insane. This country has, in the midst of a pandemic, no less, when we should be able to count on the goodwill of our fellow Americans, we should be, ha- we, we should be seeing nothing on the news other than people who are stepping up, keeping businesses afloat, helping their neighbor, coming together. That's what we should see. Instead, we have the Democrat shock troops breaking windows, stealing merchandise, burning down businesses, punching, kicking, assaulting defenseless people in the streets, and screaming epithets and insanity at our police officers in cities across America while violence is skyrocketing in many of them. That's what we see. That's what's actually happening. And it's happening as a direct consequence of false Democrat narratives, notably the narrative of the BLM movement, Black Lives Matter, that cops hunt and murder uh, unarmed black men, which is, as they pose the narrative, a lie. It is an extreme rarity. It's the equivalent of telling somebody you cannot. It is reckless for you to go outside your house because you could be struck by lightning. True, you could be, but I don't think that you live your life around the fear of being struck by lightning. The Democrat Party is telling young black uh, males in this country to be afraid of a lightning strike from the police constantly and in every action they take. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's immoral, it's fear-mongering, and it's hurting the country. It's hurting the country. Barack Obama and his administration, which Joe Biden, of course, was the vice president of, were completely inept on economic management. The slowest recovery, the worst, weakest recovery out of a recession since World War II. That's a tough record to argue with. If we had had a candidate with some backbone and a candidate who really understood the problems facing America and not just a wannabe wishy-washy technocrat like Mitt Romney, we might have been able to defeat Obama in his second term just based on that economic record. And let's not forget that while we had the first black president, we also had the rise of the BLM movement and the initial wave of anti-cop insanity that we've now seen the second wave of in the aftermath of George Floyd's killing. And it hasn't gone away. None of this has gone away. In fact, I think it's going to be much worse. You have to remember that as we go in to actually cast our votes in now, what is it, 70 days-ish, 74 days, I think, as we get ready for that, all of the violence that you've seen in recent months, all the destruction, all the mayhem on the streets, is a very clear threat. One that they're hoping you will all heed. One that they're hoping will keep many of you at home so you don't cast a vote for Trump and the Republican Party or perhaps will even change your mind because you're scared that somebody may ask who'd you vote for and you don't want your business to be targeted. You don't want, you don't want to be singled out within your community professionally or otherwise for retribution if Trump is to win 
But for me, there's no more clear defining trait of the Democrat Party right now than the, the near promise that if their candidate, who's a joke and who is an, unser- an unserious leader in Joe Biden, and I won't even get into Kamala right now, if that candidate does not win this election, there will be violence, there will be destruction, there will be bloodshed in the streets. The Democrat Party is telling you that every day now. They are making it quite clear that that's going to happen. And as I've said before, the only way you can deal with that kind of political terrorism is head on, shields high, do what you know is right. Do not let the Marxist maniacs seize control of this country this election. I can't believe we're losing our home that we didn't even sell. That's what Deborah said when she found out that she was the victim of home title theft which is a crime that can actually cost you your home. Here's how it works. The bad guys find your information online because that's where it is. And then they forge your signature stating that you sold your home to them. Then you don't find out about this often until the eviction notice arrives. It's a very devastating fraud with obviously enormous economic implications for you and your family. Take action today. Home Title Lock can create a virtual barrier around your home's title. This can help protect you from this growing fraud. All you have to do is go to HomeTitleLock.com, enter promo code BUCK, and you can get 30 free days of protection. Again, that's HomeTitleLock.com, enter promo code BUCK for 30 free days of protection. You can also check at the site to see if you're a victim of this crime and don't even know it yet. HomeTitleLock.com, promo code BUCK. You know who we really need to hear from right now in this pivotal election? An 18-year-old pop star. Play 22. You don't need me to tell you things are a mess. Donald Trump is destroying our country and everything we care about. We need leaders who will solve problems like climate change and COVID, not deny them. Leaders who will fight against systemic racism and inequality. And that starts by voting for someone who understands how much is at stake. Someone who's building a team that shares our values. It starts with voting against Donald Trump and for Joe Biden. Silence is not an option and we cannot sit this one out. We all have to vote like our lives and the world depend on it because they do. The only way to be certain of the future is to make it ourselves. Please register. Please vote. Why doesn't she say, please vote Biden? Because that's what she's saying, right? I always like the Democrats have this thing where they just they 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 are clearly partisans. But then it's just, well, we just want people to vote. Just just go out and vote. I mean, Donald Trump is Hitler, but just just go out and vote. You know, I'm not telling you to vote for you can vote for the you know mass murdering genocidal maniac Donald Trump if you want. Uh, But I just want you to vote. This is what Democrats love to do uh, because they've they've convinced themselves if only. If only they can get more people, more low information voters to go out. Well, that may actually be true. So as I say it out loud, I go, well, they, they might have a point. Find people who know nothing about politics or how society works. Find the uh, find the takers in society and tell them that they can get more from the makers. If only they vote for Joe Biden. Billie Eilish. I mean, some of her songs are pretty catchy. I did actually see her live in concert. It was pretty good. I was, it was a festival. It was a festival. I didn't just go to see it. There was, there was Blink-182 there, which actually made me feel kind of old. Look, you've got to check out the latest entry in the Scott Harvath series of thrillers from number one New York Times bestseller, Brad Thor. It's called Near Dark. Near Dark is the latest Scott Harvath where he has to unravel a conspiracy that's already taken the lives of some of the people closest to him, including his wife. He's going to have to call upon all of his skills as a former Navy SEAL, somebody who understands espionage and how the underworld works to prevent catastrophe from happening. He even teams up with a Norwegian special agent who's every bit as skilled and dedicated as he is. You've got to check out Brad Thor's latest The Scott Harvath thriller series is incredible, and this is perhaps the best one yet. The book is Near Dark. You can get it on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Again, Brad Thor's latest in the Scott Harvath series, 
Near Dark. Check it out today on Amazon or wherever books are sold. All right, so they had their big DNC thing last night, and Kamala Harris accepts her nomination for vice president. We're all supposed to just swoon. Oh, we're supposed to think this is amazing. Fantastic. Here's Kamala. Let's let's take these one by one. Let's analyze together. Let's work through what was said, what it means, and I guess that's what we do here in the Freedom Hut. Play uh, 15. I keep thinking about that 25-year-old Indian woman all of five feet tall, who gave birth to me at Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, California. On that day, she probably could have never imagined that I would be standing before you now and speaking these words. I accept your nomination for Vice President of the United States of America. Kamala has an interesting personal history, interesting personal story, and uh, see, I'm I'm not I'm not mean. I'm not a, a huge lib, so I don't try to tear down everything about a person. She got a nice story. That's fine. Uh, why should this person be vice president for a ticket? Remember, this isn't the normal. And I'm starting with the vice president here on purpose. Right? Why should the this person be the vice president of the United States when we've already been told that Biden Biden has said that he's a one termer? So what what are we to make of this? Right. What are we to think of, of that and how it factors into the vice presidential pick? And I would just say that there's nothing about Kamala Harris that makes me think she would be a good president of the United States. I think she's a very interchangeable Democrat politician with a lot of other Democrat politicians, except she is th- th- there are the ways that Kamala distinguishes herself. She is truly transactional in nature and it feels like she'll just she does whatever she needs to do to get whatever she wants and that's the way that she is and there's something about her that is just inauthentic there's something about her that just doesn't really seem to you know all come together with it you know it just doesn't it doesn't connect that's the word that all the political consultants would probably use, not the ones that she's paying, because they're going to tell her she connects, and it's amazing. But, but there's a, a frostiness, a, a sense of fakery that comes from Kamala the politician, that lack of warmth and connection to the, the people that she wants to represent. That's why she didn't do well the last time around. She didn't do well when she was in, the, in that primary Uh, contest at all it's not like she was the second place finisher and now she's in the vp slot i don't i can't even remember what place she was in but and the only way that she had and this is classic democrat stuff the only way that she had a real moment the only time that she started to break out from the democrat pack was when she just went went for the long knife against biden's reputation i mean she just tried to slash and burn Biden on the busing issue, which I I will tell you, busing is one of those is one of those areas where people know what they're all all supposed to say, that if you oppose busing, you're a bad person. The actual research into the issue of busing busing shows that there were a lot of students and families that absolutely hated it, including a lot of black students and families who did not want to get sent an hour and a half. If someone told me I had to commute an hour and a half to my school or I could walk. 10 minutes or, you know, 15 minutes. uh, That's an easy choice for me. All right. But I digress. So Kamala is supposed to get this party excited. And and I got to tell you, I'm and some of the poll. There are polls that show a lot of things. And I I do believe that the Republican support for Trump is undercounted in these polls. But I, I, I think this Democrat field or rather this Democrat DNC and, and the lineup that they have, I mean, the field of speakers in a sense. It's sure there are people there, you know, 45 percent of of the vote right now that's actually going to show up at Election Day. And maybe it's more like 49 percent probably is they're, they're going to vote for a Democrat no matter what. So you've really just got to think of this in terms of who is still persuadable and who may you know, it's the it's turnout and it's 
changed minds, right? Who can you get to show up that may not, and who can you convince to cast their vote for you that was definitely going to go to the polls anyway, but hasn't yet decided? I, I, I've got to say, for the, for the voters, I would think the voters who uh, would be deciding based upon economic record i don't know anybody who could fit who could say with a straight with a straight face who knows anything that joe biden is a is more knowledgeable about the economy and has a better understanding about how to have successful uh policies so that we all have more jobs and the guy knows nothing about this i mean biden is a truly unimp- intellectually unimpressive person uh, Kamala strikes me as much, much sharper than Biden. I will say that. I think that Kamala is the, the brains of the operation, so to speak. And obviously doesn't also have maybe early stage, early stage dementia. Uh, but they're having all these other Democrats come out to make the case, and they view it as, you know, the DNC views this as, as bolstering the message. But I, I think it's great, for example, that they want to pull Hillary Clinton out. Hello! They pull Hillary Clinton out. So that we can all hear from her um, because this is the person who was rejected in 2016, who had every, every advantage, everything behind her. And I'm hoping that it will remind voters of why they rejected her. You know, they, they still, the Democrats have this narrative that they didn't really lose. It's the Stacey Abrams syndrome. They, they won even though they lost. And Hillary certainly thinks so. As she said last night, made it clear, still a sore loser. Play clip 10. If Trump is reelected, things will get even worse. That's why we need unity now more than ever. Remember back in 2016 when Trump asked, what do you have to lose? Well, now we know our health care, our jobs, our loved ones our leadership in the world, and even our post office. Vote for honest elections so we, not a foreign adversary, choose our president. Vote for the diverse, hopeful America we saw in last night's roll call. And don't forget, Joe and Kamala can win by three million votes and still lose. Take it from me. So we need numbers overwhelming. So Trump can't sneak or steal his way to victory. What a slimy, underhanded, perfect Clinton moment we have here. I mean, it's, it's not as bad as when the, you know, the, the lady that worked for Epstein was giving me a rub and all that stuff. Because, you know, that photo just came out this week. And I mean, I, I had no idea about Epstein being a creepster. I swear. I swear. That's what he says. I only flew on that plane like. I don't know, a couple of dozen times. Did I say four times? I meant like 40 times or a little less than that, but closer to that. But, you know, I'm, I'm, the, the Clintons, I'll tell you this, I know this from people who have been around them because I, I even have some sources. I have some sources pretty high up in Democrat circles, but they obviously hide their association with me on, on you know, fear of their lives. Uh, but the Clintons, there's no way to get time with Hillary or Bill Clinton faster than giving them a free ride on a private jet. They love their private jet travel. Um, really just the, the Clintons there's so much that the Clintons did to the Democrat Party that I, I it, it's like the Democrat Party has Clinton PTSD and has never really faced up to it you know has never really dealt with that trauma because the Clintons erased any claim that the Democrat Party can have of of when I say erase the claim they're still going to make the claims they're going to lie and everything else but to a, a, an objective to an honest observer the Democrat Party debased itself, debased itself from a rule of law perspective by saying it was no problem that Bill Clinton clearly and intentionally lied under oath about a material issue that was that was really meaningful. It's no problem that Bill Clinton, from a moral perspective, uh, tr- truly debased the presidency. And, you know, you can't even say the phrase blue dress without everybody going, ah, you know, everyone knows right away. And Democrats completely rallied around him and pretended that they pretended that that was all a witch hunt and that 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 was a hoax, even though it was one of the first great and I say great as in big momentous uh, gaslightings in my lifetime in politics. You know, the problem is not the disgustingly greedy and rapacious 
Clintons. The problem is the people that have a problem with the Clintons. And Hillary here gives you another taste of what it means to have our politics so polluted, so utterly polluted by their brand, by the Clinton brand, by by making this claim again that that Trump will steal the election, undermining his authority as commander in chief. And they've been doing this from day one that he didn't really win. And this is the crybaby mentality of the Democrats. This is the delusion that they uh, they feed into. And that they tell themselves so they can sleep well at night. That that Trump didn't actually defeat their handpicked super establishment candidate. That the reality is that Trump, even though they said he cheated, they investigated the cheating and there was no cheating. Hillary's still out there saying, well, he cheated. And the rest of us just say, thank God Hillary Clinton is not going to be president. Play clip 11. I wish Donald Trump knew how to be a president because America needs a president right now. Throughout this time of crisis, Americans keep going, checking on neighbors, showing up to jobs as first responders, hospitals, grocery stores, nursing homes. Yes, it still takes a village. And we need leaders equal to this moment of sacrifice and service. We need Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Well, she says she wished Donald Trump knew how to be president. I'm happy to tell you that Hillary Clinton's never going to know how it feels to be president. They understand that in this democracy, the commander in chief does not use the men and women of our military who are willing to risk everything to protect our nation as political props to deploy against peaceful protesters on our own soil. They understand that political opponents aren't un-American just because they disagree with you. A free press isn't the enemy, but the way we hold officials accountable. That our ability to work together to solve big problems like a pandemic depend on a fidelity to facts and science and logic and not just making stuff up. None of this should be controversial. These shouldn't be Republican principles or Democratic principles. They are American principles. But at this moment, this president and those who enable him have shown they don't believe in these things. Tonight, I'm asking you to believe in Joe and Kamala's ability to lead this country out of these dark times and build it back better. I do not miss having to listen to that guy give speeches all the time. I'll tell you that. That's one thing that is better about the last last four years. That's for sure. A lot of things that are better about the last four years. Uh, but I, I do not miss that. It's, it's so frustrating for me because I hear this stuff at the DNC. I'm watching these speeches and I, 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 know, I know it's not helpful. So apologies for, for this catharsis that, I, that I'm going to engage in here. But Can you imagine if we hadn't been hit by COVID-19? I mean, the Democrats would be subjected to all all they'd be able to come up with is the most laughable anti-Trump Russia and he's a racist. It would be 2016 all over again. I I think that you would actually have seen some major uh, some major blue states go red. I really do think that the that the Trump of 2019 would would kick the uh, Biden Harris tickets, but, but this pandemic puts, look it, let's be very clear. It puts everything in this kind of hazy, depressed state. And you just don't know. You just don't know. So that's why the messaging battle here is all important. Who's going to get blamed for what we've seen this past year? Uh, this, this rejection of science narrative that, that Obama uses. Uh, I, I've got to tell you, uh, what is it that they're saying exactly? Where, where is the science rejected? Is it really just all about mask wearing? Because the president and all the others have endorsed social distancing all along. And I'm, I'm telling you, uh, the, the information that's coming out now on, uh, sur- uh, on T-cell immunity combined with antibodies in the population, if you see this now, 20% of the population gets infected in an area and then the virus recedes dramatically. That's what's happening. And you can run that. Look at the numbers yourself. Run that experiment all over the world. 20% of the population gets infected and then the numbers recede. That's a pattern. 
Now, you can say that that's just a coincidence, but the only thing that makes sense based on what's happened in New York and New Jersey and then the rest of the country is that this virus spreads. It's effectively impossible to contain unless you have universal shelter in place, which we, we never even did that. That would be stay home for two weeks. No one goes anywhere. We've never had that. We can't do that. I mean, that would be a true cessation of society. Uh, but they keep saying that, that Trump rejects Trump rejects the science and uh, that he also doesn't believe in American principles. A Democrat party is saying this that has become a party that rejects your right to have the state provide safety and security for you, which is its first obligation. Right. This is what takes us out of a state of nature. Go to Hobbes Leviathan, which everybody in every poli sci class has to read at some point, you know, protecting us. From what we would deal with, you know, a life that is uh, nasty, brutish and short. That's the state's obligation. And they're un increasingly unwilling. Democrats are unwilling to fulfill that obligation because they would rather posture as a kind of pseudo revolutionary movement that believes in a future without police, a future without immigration and customs enforcement, a future without law enforcement of any kind, except for. The deep state fed cops who were trying to take down the Trump administration and threaten Trump's advisors and family members, those cops, I'm sure they'd want to keep. So, you know, they don't want police that protect you from rape, murder and and pillaging at the hands of the looters. They want that to go away, but they still want their political Stasi. The Democrats still want to have that possibility where they can under the under the color of law, under the guise of justice, send people with guns after their perceived political enemies. Let's not forget, not only did we have spying on the Trump campaign from Democrats, we also had a rejection of the good faith, peaceful transition of power. Democrats, dozens of them, refused to show up to the inauguration and started saying right away the election was stolen. These people are a disgrace, friends. The Democrat Party has become a disgrace.